Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of the I've Heard of Her discussion series. Um, today we are talking about Jane Adams. She is a social activist out of Chicago. Super exciting stuff, so let's get to it. Um, we are out of the Civil War Museum in Kenosha, Wisconsin, just in case you stumbled across this and you don't know who we are. Um, it's part of three museum campus. Uh, we also have the Kenosha Public Museum and the uh, Dinosaur Discovery Museum. But the Civil War Museum, we uh, focus on the upper Midwestern story of the Civil War. If you have not been, when we open again to the public, please come and check us out. <laughs> and as you can tell, we're in different locations. Um, so we're still doing this virtually, but hopefully soon we'll be at least together to record these. Yes. <laughs> um, so who we are, my name is Jen, um, I'm Curator of Education, my email is right here on the screen, and we decided to do a fun fact so you guys can get to know us. So my fun fact this time is I'm a blacksmith, which is pretty cool. It's pretty awesome. Um, I would like to request you make me a horseshoe. Okay. <laughs> My name is Samantha Mahalik. I am the registrar here at our three museums, which actually means I'm part of the exhibits and collections team. So this is my little dabble into education, and Jen and I have so much fun doing this. Um, my fun fact is, not, I feel like it's not as exciting as a blacksmith, but I took Latin in high school. That was my foreign language, um, which I don't know why my high school <laughs> offers this. <laughs> like, but anyway, I remember, um, all I really remember is a terrible joke. It's semper ubi, sub ubi, which literally translates to always wear underwear. <laughs> so there's kind of your a, Latin dad joke of the day. I was going to say dad joke in honors of Father's Day coming up. Um, <laughs> one other fun fact is I have a dog that really wants to join me on this call right now. So she's barking upstairs. So you might hear some, some dog barks. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, she can't actually join. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to talk about why we do this program. This program is something that we regularly do once a month. When the museum was open, we were doing it over lunch, the third Thursday of the month. So when the museum reopens and programs are able to happen, we hope to continue this um, not necessarily virtually, but in person. Until then, we're going to keep doing it virtually, though. So we do this program because it is the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage, so the right to vote for women. And a few days ago, actually, in Wisconsin, it was the 101 anniversary of it being a state um, amendment. So... Great! <laughs> but we, we want to do this to make sure that people know about the women in history. And a lot of times the people we talk about are people you may have heard of, but you're not really sure why they were remembered or why they're famous. So we want to delve a little deeper into their life. When we do this in person, it is an hour long program, so we can get a little deeper into what's going on. Unfortunately, on these um, virtual ones, we try and keep it about 20 minutes, so we're not going to be able to go too deep in their life. Mm -hmm. Samantha, do you want to talk about why you picked this picture? <laughs> oh yes, of course. So I picked this picture um, because that is Miss Ida B. Wells of Chicago. Um, you may remember from two minutes ago when I said Jane Addams was also from Chicago. They're contemporaries. They um, lived and worked in Chicago at the same time. Um, and so I just got really excited because our very first I've heard of her that we did. We did on Ida B. Wells, and she is just a totally amazing woman. Um, if you were not there and you don't know who Ida B. Wells is, please Google her. She's fantastic. Yeah, there's some great biographies on her. That too, yeah. All right, so we'll go ahead and we'll get started with the person we're talking about today, Jane Addams. So um, Jane was born September 6, 1860 in Cedarville, Illinois. So that is located between Galena and Rockford. So <laughs> the northwest part of Illinois, small farming community. Um, she's actually born the eighth out of nine children. So a large family. And <laughs> 
her dad owns a mill. He is, um, he's a Civil War veteran, and he also personally knows Abraham Lincoln. So he's kind of a well-known person in his town. He's one of the wealthiest city, uh, citizens of his town as well. Um, her mother, though, dies in childbirth when she's two years old. So she is raised by her dad and he takes care of the nine children. Again, because he does have so much wealth, she does grow up in privilege. Um, they're raised on Christian values. They're raised on kind of this social mission and really helping those that don't have as much as they do. And I'm sure that they encountered some of that just with where they were around because it was a, a smaller farm community, but it really is raising those kids in values that are going to influence the rest of her life. So a little bit more about her. She graduated from the Rockford Female um, Seminary in 1881. Uh, she's really considered one of those new women. <laughs> so they're college educated, they're independent. This is kind of the wave of feminism we see coming out of the Civil War. So right at, during the Civil War and following, women have to work outside the home for the first time in America because a lot of times during the Civil War, their husbands are off at war, maybe they don't come home. They need to be able to make sure that their family can survive. So we see this wave of, the first wave of feminism that's working outside the home, that is getting college, college educated, that is getting jobs, and they're becoming citizens of this country. So um, she's kind of seen in that first new women wave. Uh, and then she is a member of the first class awarded a bachelor's degree from here. So again, kind of setting her own route, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Laying her own foundation. And then she really was a smarty pants. She was really good at school. She became valedictorian. Um, she made lasting friendships. And we're going to talk about one of her friends in a moment. And she really discovered herself and established that drive to continue to help people down the road. Um, after her time at Rockford, she actually leaves and goes to Philadelphia, of all places, which is pretty far away from her family, and she studies women's medical, or she studies at the Women's Medical College, but unfortunately she's unable to finish. She has to return because of her family and some health issues. Yeah. So, um, after her health improves a bit, um, what does she do, right? So um, she formed Hill House, which is in Chicago. Um, it is a settlement house. Uh, settlement uh, houses really began in the 1880s in London. That's where they really kicked off. They were a response to um, kind of issues in urbanization called caused by uh, rapid urbanization, industrialization, and immigration um, uh, that was happening during this time, the rapid rise of factories and, and things like that, people moving from the country to the city for work. Um, so Adams went to London uh, with her friend, Ellen Gate Starr, that was uh, one of her fellow Rockford alumna um, in 1888. Those two traveled to London for a trip and they saw the work being done at these settlement houses. And Adams vowed, I wanna do this in the United States. This is something that we could really benefit over here. And so she did. Uh, her and Star opened a whole house in 1889, so just one year later after her London trip. And um, they had a, a goal in mind to um, teach uh, the poor and immigrants that were moving um, into Chicago everything they could, um, from basic life skills to things like art and literature. They really wanted their, their house to be a, a big space for education. So they established a daycare and a kindergarten for working mothers. They provided job training. They provided English language, cooking, and acculturation classes for immigrants. They established a job placement bureau, a community center, a gym. There was an art gallery. So this complex, which started out as one house, Hull House, eventually grew to be 13 buildings in this neighborhood. So it was really like a, it was a, a complex um, and they supported 
a ton of clubs and activities, um, such as a labor museum. There was a Jane club for single working girls, and the girls could also live at Hull House if they needed to. Um, there was meeting places for trade union groups, and there was a, a, just a vast array of cultural events always happening at Hull House. And this wasn't like a, a patronizing thing. You know, Adams and the other workers at Hull House weren't just saying, this is what I'm going to teach you because this is what I'm going to know. Um, they really responded to the feedback of the people they were, they were working with. And um, so they kind of shifted course when need be for um, different things that were requested that they learn or offer. Um, and uh, Adams and Starr, uh, there were several other women who were uh, involved in this, Florence Kelly, Dr. Alice Hamilton, Julia Lathrop, Sophonise but Breckenridge, and Grace and Edith Abbott, those two were sisters. Um, and not only did Adams work there full time, she also lived there um, until she died. So Hull House was um, very, very important to her as all of her work is. Yeah, and I think we, you and I have talked about this. This is kind of the first time that we see social work, especially in Chicago areas, in this capacity. It wasn't a field yet. <laughs> um, that's something that's going to come later. And even the kindergartens weren't really around yet either. So a lot of the stuff that she's doing is really on the forefront of um, that kind of movement and reform, too. Um, yeah, definitely. I, yeah, and I'm going to talk next. So I do want to point out this picture down here, which is her a little uh, later in life. And she's surrounded by really cute immigrant kids. Um, and these actually reflect the, the children of the neighborhood towards the end, because I would like to talk about the context of the Hull House. So if you go to the Hull House today, where it stands, it's part of the UIC campus. So it's located on Halstead, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it's not really in the neighborhood that it used to be in. So if you go there, it's surrounded by big buildings and lots of traffic. Not the case. <laughs> um, where it originally was, it really was embedded in a neighborhood of immigrants and people that needed those services. So in the 1890s, right after it opened, the neighborhood was actually Italian, Irish, German, Greek, Bohemian and Russian and Polish Jewish immigrants. That's quite the melting pot of people in one area. Um, so you can see how her services at the Hall House would reflect the needs of those that the immigrants that were in that area at the time. From 1890, it actually goes all the way till 1920. She's still working, she's still in charge, she's still living there. Um, but the neighborhood is no longer kind of that European melting pot. It's seen as African-American and mainly Mexicans that are moving into this area. So we can kind of see who was using the space of the Hull House, but then also kind of that um, shift in immigration in Chicago as a whole too, and who's really moving their migration and immigration. Mm -hmm. Okay, because the work at Hull House was not enough, we're gonna <laughs> talk about more <laughs> activism um, because even though Hull House is an amazing venture on its own, Jane Addams did a lot more than just Hull House. Um, so her and the other women also that started Hull House um, helped launch the Immigrants Protective League, the Juvenile Protective Association. Um, they pushed for the establishment of the first juvenile court in the nation. Other before that, you know, kids were just being tried in adult court. Um, and they also started a juvenile psychopathic clinic which was later changed to the Institute for Juvenile Research, <laughs> thankfully. Um, the, because of their work, the Illinois legislature enacted a protective legislation for women and children in 1893. So this can be directly linked to the work of these women. Um, and so she did it on a state level. In 1907, she founded, uh, she was a founding member of the National Child Labor Committee. So now she's trying to do this on a federal level and in 1912, there was created the Federal Children's Bureau, and they were critical in passing the federal legislation on child labor in 1916, which 
really um, affected how <laughs> um, the children could be used in working situations, um, which is, you know, it's good. It's a good thing. Children shouldn't be working all day. They should be going to school. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, in addition to that, um, she led the movement of the start of the School of Social Work at the University of Chicago. Um, she's known as the mother of social work, and she served as the first woman president of the National Conference of Charities and Corrections, which is now known as the non National Conference of Social Work. So she's instrumental in that as well. In addition to all of the social work she did, um, she was an officer in the National American Women's Suffrage Association, which was one of the um, groups that pushed for women's suffrage in the United States. Um, she wrote articles, tons of articles, in places like the Ladies' Home Journal to try and convince people that women having the vote was a good thing, <laughs> that we need, we need this. Um, so she was on the forefront of that work as well, which if you're looking at this slide, you can see the top center picture that we have. That is her standing in a car in a suffrage march. <laughs> so she was out there on the front lines doing that work as well. But she's not done, right? <laughs> she's not done. <laughs> she goes on to become a founding member of NAACP in 1909. She also is pretty well known for promoting peace during World War I. So she's very against the United States joining World War I. And then um, she really starts kind of heading a lot of these protests. So in 1915, she heads the Women's Peace Party. Um, she becomes president of the International Congress of Women. She, in 1919, she helps find the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Uh, she's president for at least 10 years and then honorary president after that. Um, she travels the world giving speeches about peace. And then this all kind of comes to a head in 1931. She wins the Nobel Peace Prize and it's the first American woman to win that prize. And we can see in the picture down below, there's her advocating for that peaceful stance. Um, and she is a founding member in 1920 of the American Civil, Civil Liberties Union. And with all this, she somehow found the time to write 11 books <laughs> all about her activism work in the Hall House, as well as multiple articles um, in different newspapers and journals. I feel like I'm not doing enough. <laughs> I know, right? She's like, I really need to step it up. <laughs> I know. But she really was taking that early lessons of the, the Christian view, the mission-driven work, and really implementing it the rest of her life and really dedicated her whole self to her work and making sure that people were considered equals and treated um, the way that they should be treated. Mm -hmm. Whew, that's a lot. That was a lot. That was a lot. <laughs> you deserve that breather. Okay. <laughs> We're going to shift gears here a little bit, and we're going to talk about um, her sexual identity. Uh, Jane Addams never married. Um, she's known for having um, close companion relationships with uh, specifically two women for her life. Um, the first we've already mentioned was Ellen Gates Starr. Um, but then there is uh, Mary Rosette Smith, which Sorry, Mary, I don't know how to say your middle name. It's R-O-Z-E-T. I don't know. So I'm going with Rosette. Um, in contemporary terms, um, historians believe that Jane Addams probably would have self-identified as a lesbian. Um, we didn't have that terminology um, at her time, so we don't know for sure. She never called herself that. Um, and the evidence we have are letters that Adams wrote to Smith uh, throughout the, their relationship, um, whether it was just friendship or something more. Um, they met in 1889 at Hull House. Um, Smith worked there, and um, they were close until Smith's death in 1934. Um, unfortunately, we only have Mary's or we only have Jane's letters. We don't have Mary's letters 
Jane Addams um, was known for destroying almost all of her correspondence. I don't know why she did that. Um, weird habit, I guess. Not sure what the reasoning was. But uh, so unfortunately, we don't have Mary's side of the story. We only have Jane's side of the story. But I mean, this is why historians believe this. So in a 1902 letter, Jane wrote to Mary, you must know, dear, how I longed for you all the time, and especially during the last three weeks. There is a reason in the habit of married folks keeping together forever yours. Which is very sweet. And in 1904, she wrote, your letters are the most cheerful things that I have, and you must know that I am mightily empty hearted without you. And in 1909, she offered three words that she never wrote to anyone else, um, and those were, I love you. So even though at this time, it was not uncommon for the so-called new woman to have very close female friendships and to not marry. Um, it's, a, it's a weird thing at this point where college educated women, um, like Jen said, they wanted to go work, they wanted to go use this education. And so it, it wasn't uncommon for them to not marry. And in that way, they then had close female friendships. Um, but the, the letters that Adams writes to Smith are, they're very different from the other letters that we have that Jane wrote to other friends. Um, and so the, the tone and her use of I love you really makes it seem as, these, as if these two were in a romantic relationship from 1889 to 1934. Um, and, you know, they, they basically spent their lives together. Yeah. And Jane actually ends up passing away from um, kind of complications from a heart attack that she never fully recovers from. She has a heart attack in 1926. Jane passes away May um, 21st, 1935, and it's 13 months after Mary passes away. So kind of stay at it then end. <laughs> it is, but that, that is another reason we wanted to talk about Jane Addams today. In addition to all of her amazing activist work, it's Pride Month. And so we wanted to share a story of what we would call, you know, a same-sex relationship. Yeah, and if you've ever seen our program before or you came to it in person, you know that we like to have conversations with our audience during this talk. It's a, um, a great dialogue, but unfortunately being on social media, we can't really get to do that. Um, so we're hoping that you can help us out with one question. So comment on our social media and tell us what you think about this. So our question that we're posing is, what modern day causes would Jane Addams advocate for? So Samantha, what do you think? Well, having said all I just did, <laughs> I definitely <laughs> think that she would um, be involved in LGBTQ causes um, and advocating, you know, for the rights of um, people that identify within in those bounds, for sure. Absolutely. I think also there's so many other movements right now happening, right? There's, there's, <laughs> Not, uh, we're not having a problem picking one. Um, I think she would be involved with the Black Lives Matter movement that's happening now. Um, but I also think that she would have a say in the immigrant conversation that happened about two years ago, especially with her work with helping the immigrants that came to Chicago in the turn of the century. And also the uh, prison pipeline conversation too. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's there's no shortage of work that Jane would have if she were here today. <laughs> we had no shortage of work then either. No, no not she, at all. She was a busy lady. So mm -hmm. please comment on our social media. We'll be posted on Facebook and just let us know what you think. What causes you think Jane Adams would have been a part of today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in addition to that, we want to know what you think in general. So this is our third program that we're doing in this online format since we've had to adjust um, to after stay-at-home orders forced us to close our building. Um, so we want to know um, 
what do you like, what you don't like. We want to be able to improve this program uh, for the people that it's for, which is you guys. So, um, and who you want to talk about. Exactly, yes. We're always looking for new and exciting women um, to learn about, so share that. Um, you can do that in the comments on this post. Otherwise, you can email either of us directly. There's our emails right on the screen. Um, be happy to hear from anyone. Just if you want to say hi, I'll, I'll say hi back. Maybe I'll include like a smiley face. So <laughs> you have that to look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to email us any questions that you might have about Jane Adams too. Yes, definitely. And we just want to give you a sneak peek for our July. It will also be virtual too, but we're going to be talking about Betsy Ross. So um, some myths surrounding her to give you a little teaser. She may have not been the first American flag seamstress. Baha, I know. So <laughs> join us in July and you hear a little bit more about Betsy Ross. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And um, thanks for watching. I've heard of her. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Bye. <laughs>